E, Guy Penelosa e, şimdi Kanada'dan geliyor ama aslında Kolombiyalı. E, uzun süre orada çalıştı Kolombiya e, Belediye Başkanı ile birlikte. Yaptığı şeyleri hata yapmamak için sayılar var çünkü. E, okumaya çalışacağım. 113 hektarlık Simon Bolivar Parkı da dahil olmak üzere diyor. Bogota'da 200 parkın hayata geçmesine öncülük etti. E, yeni Dünden beri konuştuğumuz bu sokak kapatma, sokakları kapatarak, trafiğe kapatarak çocuklara e, oyunu açma meselesini Bogota'da 121 kilometreye çıkardı. 121 kilometrelik yolu trafiğe kapatmayı e, sağladı. Ve böylece 1.7 milyon kişinin yürümesini, e, her pazar bu sokaklarda hareket etmesini katkıda bulundu. Şimdi kendisi 880 şehirler diye bir e, kuruluşun başında aynı, aynı zamanda da Dünya Kent Park, Parkları e, e, Birliği'nin e, yönetim kurulu başkanı. 880 daha iyi anlatır tabii ki ama 8 eğer kentleri 8 yaşında ve 80 yaşındakiler için uygun hale getirirsek herkes için uygun hale getiririz gibi bir e, yaklaşım var. Biz tabii ki 95 santim ve aşağısı olduğu için 8 aylık yani 8, 8, 8, 80 demekte fayda görüyorum. 8 aylıklar, 8 yaşındakiler ve 80 yaşındakilere uygun getirebilirsek eğer herkes için uygun hale getirmiş oluruz. Ee, önce değil kısa bir konuşma yapacak. Ee, ondan sonra da Cecilia e, Vaka Jones e, birkaç soruyla e, konuşmaya yanıt verecek. Değil, e, floor is yours. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. Saturday night. I hope to uh, be able to inspire and give some ideas. And we're going to be talking about cities. So it's the other way. <laughs> if we could make the screen as dark as possible. Perfect. Don't fall asleep. I'm going to show you hundreds of examples, hundreds of images. That's why I want the image to be as good as possible. So, because we're, we've been talking all day, great presentations about cities. And that is very important because that is where we live. And even this little girl is concerned that not everybody's having as good time as she is. And we're talking about cities and wealthy cities and poor cities and the challenges and the children in cities. Sometimes it can be Vienna, sometimes it can be Medellin, sometimes the city can have 10,000 people or it can have a million. It doesn't matter. The issues are the same. So what we're talking about is applicable to any city in Turkey. It can be Istanbul, gigantic, or it can be small towns. The solutions are different. We're living longer in the city of 15 million people, we're living longer in the city of 15,000 people. We need public transit in the city of 15 million, we need public transit in the city of 15,000. Maybe in one we need subways, in the other one we might need buses. And Turkey is very urban, more and more. Look at this, this has been in the last 50 years, how people are moving into the cities. All over. In just 55 years, it has gone from 31 out of 100 people living in cities to 74 out of 100, and soon it's going to be 8 out of 10. And so people are in cities. And when I've seen, I've been walking in the last visit in Istanbul, and I saw people and cities and vibrancy, and it's exciting. What is the best attraction in any city? It's people. It's people. That's why we're also talking about cities and we're talking about people. Yesterday I was working in Malmo in Sweden and it was an interesting city, much smaller than Istanbul, 200,000 people. But nevertheless, they lost half of their jobs in two years. They had to reinvent and a key element were children, families and children. And actually they did in the new developments, first they did the parks and the public spaces, and then they did the buildings. So around the world we have a population growth, 
And we got public health crisis in many ways, physical, mental, huge urban growth. We're living longer, not longer, much, much longer. You know, this is so exciting. 200 years ago, you know, we've been around human beings for around 200,000 years. But it, just 200 years ago, all of these are the countries in the world. This is the life expectancy. We didn't have any country with a life expectancy above 45. Today, we don't have any country with a life expectancy below 45. This has happened in just 200 years. It's amazing. But of course, we also have issues of climate change. And we see symptoms everywhere, even if some people don't want to believe. But it's happening. So in many ways, there's an urgency to make decisions. How do we want to live? If we have a, a shared agreement of how do we want to live, a lot of the other decisions are going to be pretty simple. Tonight, I'm going to be talking also about sustainable mobility. I'm going to talk about sustainable mobility. I mean people walking, people riding bicycles, people using public transit some new uses of cars. By the way, walking and cycling is not a joke. You know, walking and cycling is really important. It's not a frivolity. I go to many countries and say, oh, Gil, but we are an emerging and we now have cars. No, it's not a joke for anybody. Walking and cycling is the only individual mode of mobility for most people. Walking and cycling is the only individual mode of mobility for all children and youth around the world. So when we're talking about children, Walking and cycling is the only individual mode of mobility. So, so having it safe and enjoyable should be like a human right. Unless you think that only the people that have the money and the age and the desire to have a car have a right to individual mobility. That's why tonight we're also talking about democracy and human rights and equality and sustainability because everything is really linked to everything. And in addition to sustainable mobility, I also want to make emphasis on parks and public spaces. And I ask, is walking and cycling and parks and sidewalks and streets, is that important? Maybe all of us would think it is, but it's not so obvious. I've been working in more than 350 different cities around the world, in all continents. And many times I show the mayor these playgrounds and these sidewalks, and they say, Gil, go to some fundraising. But when I show them a pothole, oh my God, they go crazy. Maybe they think that a car is going to fall there. And the media plays into this craziness. This TV station hire a woman, all she does, goes and measures potholes, and has a section on TV. <laughs> Tuesdays and Fridays at 6 p.m. And the citizens, they get organized around the potholes. Not around the playground for children, not around the sidewalks for children. And when they take care of the potholes, they go and celebrate. <laughs> and then we start thinking, why? Maybe it's because when we look at Istanbul from the air, or actually any city in the world, the biggest public space, the space that belongs to all of us, the space that belongs to poor and rich and young and old and everybody, are the streets. The streets are around one third of our cities. And we know that if we walk, if we ride bicycles, if we use public transit, we're going to use streets a lot more efficient. That public space. We're going to decide, are we going to build streets for cars? or street for people, because we can do one or the other. Do we want our street to look like car storage, or actually help build community? Now here, this is very important, because here there used to be a river going through here. About 50 or 60 years ago, people were thinking, efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. So they built a road on top of the river. But you know, this is important, because many people in Turkey are talking about being efficient and, and being economically competitive. Well, today we live in an ever more globalized world. And in a globalized world, the best people, they can live anywhere. However you define best, it can be the best urban planners, it can be the best medical doctors, the best pizza makers, the best coffee makers. If I'm a good carpenter, I can live anywhere in the world. So where am I going to live? Wherever I have the best quality of life. So these people said, you know, can we go to Istanbul and ask the best people from this university to, to come and live here? Probably not. Who wants to live there? So about seven years ago, someone said, wasn't there a river going down? And they brought it out. So you want to live in this city or you want to live in this city? Same street. Same street. 
That's why sometimes people say, Gil, what's a good city? I say, a good city is where I want to sleep at home, but I want to live outside. I want to live outside. The public space is so critical. So that's why I want to thank the organizers for having invited me today, and the Bernard Van Leer Foundation and the Project Urban 95, because I think this is critical to the success of cities. So I want to be talking about how to create cities for all, how to create vibrant, successful cities with healthy communities where people are going to be happier. I'm going to put an emphasis on health and equity. In order to put things into context, I'm going to talk about Bogota and 880 cities, and then I have eight messages for Istanbul. Why Bogota? Obviously, Bogota is not ideal. It's far from ideal, but in my previous life, now I live in Canada, in my previous life I lived in Bogota, and I was commissioner, and I learned that it's not about the money. When all of these things that you have heard this afternoon and yesterday is not about the money. People will tell you, oh, we cannot do this because we don't have the money, we cannot do this park, we cannot uh, adapt this school. And then you go and they are doing elevated highways and flyovers. Money, there is tons of money. It's where are we going to use it? Also, I've been doing, for example, in the first term, we built over 200 parks. In the second, uh, uh, another six or 700 parks. So, Actually, in six years in Bogota, we did almost a thousand parks. All over the city, small ones, medium, large ones. This was one of them. The Pope came here, gave a mass for a million people, and then the Pope left, and there was nothing. Nothing happened. Not even sidewalk, nothing happened in 27 years. Why nothing happened in 27 years? Because change is hard. Change is hard in Bogota, change is hard in Istanbul, in Copenhagen, in Paris, in Nairobi, everywhere change is hard. When you try to change, around urban 95 and the cave people show up. Cave people don't want to let you change. They are the citizens against virtually everything. <laughs> but we got to become champions at finding solutions to the problems, not at finding problems to the solution. We cannot accept no for an answer. It's not about having 20 reasons why things cannot be done. We gotta find how to get it done. So it went like this for 27 years, and in four years we turned it into the nicest park for passive, for active, for contemplative recreation, things that people can do at their own pace and at their own time. Sometimes it's not just about football, it's about just sitting down and watching the trees and the, listening to the birds. Other times you might be doing things with groups or by yourself or with a friend. But the uses and activities, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more, more about uses and activities in the parks in a minute. It's critical. Something else that we did, I found a very small program of just a few kilometers and a few thousand people called Ciclovia. We turned it into the world's largest pop-up park. Sunday morning, we pop it up and people come out. Who? Everybody. It's really simple. You should do it in Istanbul and every city in Turkey. You open streets to people, you close them to cars, and the magic happens. Young and old and rich and poor and fat and skinny. Here we have, these are all of the income levels. I was obsessed that we would connect the wealthier neighbors with the poorest neighbors of the city, that everybody would connect. You know, this doesn't cost almost anything. Tell your mayors and electors to be ambitious. What is the risk? Say, okay, next year in 2019, we're gonna do it once a month, the first Sunday of every month. If it doesn't work, then you, you don't do it in 2020. What's the risk? Nothing. You are not building gymnasiums or arenas, nothing. You are just using the existing streets. But if it works, then in 2020 you say, okay, we're not gonna do it monthly, we're gonna do it weekly. We interconnected all of the main parts of the city, so that people would get, use it not only as an end, but as a means, and we get people of all ages coming out, but not everybody wants to walk or bike or skate, so along the road we do aerobics and tai chi and cha-cha-cha, all kinds of activities. It's fantastic. You get children, little babies on carriages, they're zero to five, but also you get the hundred year old, you get everybody, young and old and rich and poor and fat and skinny. All you really need is two feet and a heartbeat and you're gonna be there. Every Sunday and holiday, so it's 52 Sundays plus holidays, about 65 days of the year, we get 1.7 million people. One out of four citizens, every Sunday they go out. 
This is amazing. But it's not about recreation. Not only is it about recreation, it's about changing minds. All of a sudden, people realize that the streets that are one third of our city are public space. They belong to all of us, and they can have different uses according to the time of the day, the day of the week, the week of the year. And it has turned into a virus, but a positive virus. Who would have thought that the city of angels and car now they have it? So cities of all over the place, cities of 20 million people like Mexico, or cities of 10,000 or 15,000, there are cities of all sizes all, everywhere. Rich countries, poor countries, it's about social integration as well. We've been working in Cape Town and Johannesburg. You know, seven years ago there was none in India. Now India has more than 70 open streets programs. It's different activities, but everything is about physical activity. The common denominator is physical activity. Paris. Paris is fantastic because Paris used to have this program. They went crazy in the summer. From the middle of July to the middle of August, they would do a big flash. And they would go out, look at, along the highway. <laughs> Who would have thought the French people would be so fun? <laughs> They are great. But then they said, you know, if it works for 30 days a year, what do we do it all year? And then it went from Paris Plus to Paris Respire. And then during 30 days, they still have their, their craziness. But now 52 Sundays, they continue to have their open streets. 52 Sundays along the Seine River and in many other places. You know, this is great also because we meet each other as equals. We meet. Whether it's Guadalajara or whether it's Bogota or Paris, this is the only place where I've seen that we meet each other as equals. And that is very powerful. It's the only place where I see the presidents of the, of the large corporations and their spouses and families doing meeting with the minimum wage workers that cleans their floors and their spouses and children as equals. It doesn't matter if one has a $5,000 bike and the other one has a $50 bike. It doesn't matter if someone has $250 shoes and the other one $20 shoes. They meet as equals. That doesn't happen anywhere else. They don't live in the same buildings. The children don't go to the same school. They don't go to the same restaurants. But it, this is why this is so important and so magical. In the following term, after I was commissioned, one of my brothers became mayor. And this is what the Japanese corporation were suggesting, elevated highways. Fortunately, he said no. Maybe the Japanese were more interested in selling cars than in solving mobility. This was a huge issue. All the cars used to park on the sidewalks. Just getting the cars out of the sidewalk was a huge fight. People tend to think, oh, it's easy here. No, it's never easy anywhere. But it's doable. It's doable. If you have cl clear what it is that you want to do. Children couldn't walk on the sidewalks because the cars were, had totally taken over the sidewalks. And the retail, they hired hundreds and hundreds of people to get signatures to impeach the mayor. And actually, they got more than 200,000 signatures. It was really, really tough. Finally, there was a referendum, and it was approved, and it, it was really nice. Sidewalks are so critical, and I'll go back into it, into it. The bus rapid transit, this used to be the, the transit system. And in 36 months, from idea to implementation, and I've seen here in Istanbul, that you had a really nice BRT on the highway going towards the airport. You know, this, sub, this BRT, moves more people than 90% of the subways of the world. But I want to show you 200 kilometers of protected bikeways. Istanbul could be fantastic for bikeways if it was safe to ride bicycles. In three years, we went from a few hundred to 280 kilometers when there was nothing from zero to 280 kilometers. Always separating pedestrians and cyclists. And in many of these places, the neighborhoods were so poor that it's almost impossible to imagine the level of poverty in some of these neighborhoods. And look at the quality of the sidewalks and the bikeways. Why do we need to do good quality of pedestrian and cycling infrastructure? Part of it is because it's going to be safer. But just as important, because we need to dignify the people walking. We need to dignify the people cycling. So we need to have plans and plans. By the way, when I said it's not an issue of money, it is an issue of priorities. For example, here there was not enough money for walking, cycling, and cars. So they said cars, a future administration will take care of the cars. Of course, it's an issue of priorities. But it's totally doable. It's about that dignity, it's about making it safe, it's about the environment. It, it's about, by the way, when I'm talking this evening about walking, I'm talking about anybody that moves at the speed of the pedestrian. But now I run two organizations. 880 cities and world urban parks, 
And if you have any comments, you can tweet them. That one. And I've been lucky that I've been able to work in over 350 different cities in all continents. World Urban Parks. Hopefully, Istanbul and other cities will join. We think that everybody should have parks, quality, within, within walking distance. And free. And we have an academy, and we also organize conferences. Next month is in Melbourne. Next year, there's one in Mexico. There's one in Denver. Greater and greater, probably the best conference in urban parks. And we have committees, like advocacy committees. Children Play and Nature is what our most successful committee. Children Play and Nature, making that connection of children, of play, and nature. If you want more information, you can go to worldurbanparks.org. It's a not-for-profit, of course. But people everywhere say, Gil, what's 880 cities? Well, 880 cities, it's not about walking or cycling. It's not about parks or streets or sidewalks. Those are the means, not the end. The end is how can we help create successful cities? You know, every time that I go to some place, I try to go the day before and see the venue where I'm going to speak. The other day I was in Warsaw, in Poland, and I went to the place where I'm going to speak outdoors, and I see all of these people dancing, and I say, my God, how am I going to compete with them? And then I saw the DJ, DJ Vika. <laughs> We are living longer. She's an entrepreneur. She sets up the equipment and goes from city to city, from park to park. So it's about that. It's about successful cities with healthy communities for people of all ages. The little babies, since they are really small, they use the street, they use the city, they are in the public places. So that's the idea. And anywhere I am, people always say, Gil, is this intersection safe? Can my children walk to school? Can my grandparents ride their bike to the park? Can they walk to public transit or to get eggs or milk? Look, you don't need to be a transportation engineer to have a city that is nice for children. It's three simple steps. We call it the rule of common sense. Unfortunately, common sense seems to be the least common of the senses. Step number one, think of a child that you love, someone around eight years old. They can be this little girl in Brazil or this boy in Japan. It's about that. It's about Think of someone, your, your son, your daughter, your grandchild. It can be someone in, in Tirana, or it can be in Kazakhstan, or it can be someone upside down. And once you have that boy or girl in mind, step number two, think of someone around 80 years old that you also love, your parents, your grandparents, brothers, sisters. And when you have the child and the older adult, step number three, would you send them across that intersection? Would you send them walking to take public transit to get eggs or milk? Would they feel safe? If you would, it's because he's safe enough. If you would notice, because it's not, and we need to do it better. What if everything we did in Istanbul, everything, the sidewalk, the crosswalk, the school, the park, the playground, the restaurant, the building, everything had to be great for an 8 and an 80. Not a 2 80, it's 8 and 80 as an indicator species. Because if it's good for the 8 and it's good for the 80, it's going to be good for everybody from 0 to over 100. We need to stop building cities as if everybody was 30 year old and athletic and build great cities for all. That is the concept of 880. It's simple, but it's powerful. And like Einstein said, we can also progress by using the same kind of thinking that we used when we created them. So I want to take you through eight messages here for Istanbul. The first one, we have a fantastic opportunity, but also a huge responsibility for especially the, the students at the university. Today, we got about 3.5 billion people living in cities. Within the lifetime of the students at this university, we're going to double that to 7 million. Within the lifetime, that has never happened before and will never happen that we are increasing by 3.5 billion people living in cities. And it can be very nice and civilized. And it's going to happen in their lifetime. Imagine how exciting for anybody that is working in things related to cities. The opportunity that we have. You, that means that half of the home that we will have within the lifetime of the students have not been built yet. Do not exist today. So we have a great opportunity. And Turkey's population is also growing. These are the projections of the population. It's going to peak around 2050. So it's going to grow around 20%. Istanbul is going to grow around 35%. And all of this is going to happen in the next 40 years. So if that's going to happen in the next 40, let's see what have we done in the last 40. Because if what we've been doing is good, let's just do more of the same. Well, in the last 40, these eight guys have more wealth than half of the people in the world. Imagine the media power, the economic power, the political power. 
You know, this is what we've been doing in the last 40 years. Horrible, horrible. All over the world, we've been leaving the issue of housing to supply and demand, and supply and demand doesn't work where there is no supply and demand. The land is fixed. So no matter how much demand there is, there's not gonna be more land. So if the government doesn't intervene, this is what we are gonna continue doing in countries all over the world. We've been focusing on cars, 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 and not on people's happiness, and this is what we've been doing. Horrible. It's very obvious that we cannot continue doing the same. And unfortunately, the emerging countries like China and Russia and Brazil are doing exactly the same things. We definitely need to do things differently. This is all of Florence and one highway intersection at the same scale. By the way, cities do not decide the population. That's more at the national level, but the cities do decide the how. This is how we've been building cities all over the world, so clearly we need to do it differently. Imagine if you are a child and zero to five or five to 10 or an older adult, you become a slave to someone that has a car even just to go for an ice cream. No far. so the last 40 years, definitely not a good example. So in the next 40, we gotta not only improve the cities that we have today, we gotta create great cities for many, many more people. So it's gonna be time to change. And change is hard, that's why cities don't change. And that's why all of you, we need all of you to really get excited about going to your city and demanding elected officials for change because saying is easier, that's why they do the same. How do people change? Maybe you have heard in the last year, the high school students in, in the US, this is how they change it, you know? No one has been able to change in the last 40 years the National Rifle Association in the US and high school students are changing the NRA. Sometimes people tell me, I live in Canada, they say, when I go to Denmark, they say, oh, go look, what is it that those Danes eat for breakfast because they are so different. They ride their bikes. No, it's because they went through an oil crisis. The whole world went through an oil crisis in the 70s. The car was taking over Copenhagen in the 50s, 60s, 70s. When they had the oil crisis, people started riding bicycles and walking. And children were being killed because there was no safe infrastructure. So every time that a child was killed, this is in Amsterdam, people would go in front of City Hall and do huge demonstrations. So Amsterdam changed when people say, oh, city, Amsterdam was built that way. No, it wasn't built that way. They were tearing down buildings for the cars, and then they had to do the opposite. Get buildings. And same thing in Copenhagen. Copenhagen was totally car oriented and same thing, the demonstrations and they started doing protected pathways. The first cycle track in Copenhagen was done in 1982 and look what happened when they started doing protected pathways. Went from less than 10% to more than 40% of the trips. That's why now they're happy. So when you're gonna change here in Istanbul, three recommendations. First, change is not unanimous. Always, people, they, there are some concerns, there will always be concerns. Change is not unanimous. Second, the general interest must prevail over the particular interest. So when you're in any meeting, the rule of the game is what is the general interest. And the general interest must prevail. And third, when you say no to something, you say, we don't want to do parks. Okay, that's fine. But then you're saying yes to more obesity, yes to more bad quality of air, yes to more of these things. So these are three elements of change. Second, we need to promote sustainable mobility. Who came walking today? Anybody came walking? One, two, three. Everybody came walking. I don't see cars here, I don't see buses here, I don't see bicycles. Every single trip begins and ends by walking. We walk to the car, we walk to public transit. Everybody walks. That's how human beings are. It's so amazing. You know, just the same way that the birds fly or the fish swim and the deer runs. People, we walk. And we love it because we use all our senses. We're walking and we see the children playing. And we hear the birds singing. And we're going from a coffee shop and we smell the aroma of the coffee. It's great. We walk all the time. We walk in the summer. We walk in the winter. But we got to make it safe. Yesterday, yesterday people driving cars killed 741 people walking. Yesterday. In one day, that's like five planes full of people. Imagine that five planes are crashed on a day. That would be, and the next day, another five planes, and the next day, another five. That's more than a person every two minutes. 
Don't call them accidents. They are not accidents because they can be avoided. They are incidents. That's why people are going into Vision Zero. Last week I was working in Sweden, in Gothenburg and in Malmo. They started with Vision Zero, but now cities all over the world are adapting. How can we eliminate people dying walking or cycling or in transit or in cars? If we're improved walking, your first pedestrian need to be a priority. They are not a priority when we do sidewalks like this. Or when we allow the cars to be on the sidewalks. Or when we don't even do sidewalks. When we don't do sidewalks, we're telling this woman, you are a second class citizen. By the way, sidewalks. There is nothing, nothing as important in a city, nothing as the sidewalk. The sidewalk is the most important element because you know, on the street, when we are on bicycles or on transit, on cars, we're going from point A to point B. On sidewalks, no. Sidewalks, you do all kinds of things. Sometimes we just sit and watch people go by. Sidewalks, we see the older people. We see the children. They go on a field trip. They go on the sidewalk to get to places. So the sidewalk is the most important. The sidewalk is important in the summer. The sidewalk is important in the winter. The sidewalk is where life, when we go to a city, and that's how they deliver mail in Sweden. In the sidewalk, the children play traditional games, or they also catch Pokemons. That's the sidewalk. We wait for the public transit, or we go, children go with their parents to get fruits and vegetables. The sidewalk, that's where we develop a sense of belonging. We go to a new city, and we go to the sidewalk, and that's where we learn about the city. That's where we get a feel of for the city. Where the city is segregated, is integrated, where there's, uh, you know, the sidewalks, like they say, walking is much more than walking. It's about democracy in so many ways. We use sidewalks to go to church, or we use sidewalks to socialize with friends. Two weeks ago, I was working in Buenos Aires, and I saw people dancing in the sidewalks. Now I was in Sweden and I remember that there they have coffee in the middle of the winter. And in Istanbul I've seen some great things. Some not so nice when I see the motorcycles on the sidewalks or the streets almost eating up the pedestrian. But then I see many great things here when, when you see people with the food or people chatting or socializing. You know, these people were just chatting about each other. They love to talk about people. This other woman just wanted to talk to a cat. <laughs> Some go to prayer and they leave their shoes on the sidewalk, others then they go to eat. Sidewalks are really important for people of all ages. Uh, we would improve walkability, there is nothing as important as lowering the speed. We need to lower the speed all over the place. 30K an hour. Not 30K zones, all of the streets. All places. When you're on a big street, it can be 40, 50, 60. When you turn into a, a, street, a residential street, you have to go to 30, all of them. Why? First, because it's easier to obey. Second, because it's easier to enforce. 20 years ago, they were talking about 30K zones. No, 30K zones doesn't work anymore. It's 30K everybody. Why 30K? For many reasons. Why, if, if a car hits you at 30K, there is 5% probability of being killed. And 50 is more than 80%. And there are many, many studies that show exactly the same thing. So all of the, also because many more people walk. People don't like walking when the cars are going by at 40, 50, 60, 70. People like walking when the cars are going at 25 or 30. That's why I'm saying these are not technical issues that I'm telling you. It's not financial. For example, if we have a small island in a crosswalk, we eliminate more than half of the incidents. Why are we still doing crosswalk without an island? When we know people are walking, the children go on a field trip, not everybody crosses on the same line, the children can stop and wait. The people that are killed the most in intersections are children and older adults. The most vulnerable people. We gotta think about them. And now some people talk about shared spaces. I can't share streets. I think that is the most ridiculous concept. When they say shared streets, everybody at their own. You know, you just gotta negotiate. You look people in the eye and you negotiate. What? Do you want this guy to be negotiating with a truck driver? You want this little girl negotiating? You know, in all of the streets, if we're gonna have a place shared, we always have to have things at the most vulnerable. So if everybody's gonna be moving at the speed of a child or an older adult, and it's gonna be enforced bumps and narrow and whatever, every, all the time. But it cannot be shared and everybody in their own terms negotiating. I mean, my mom is 80, 88. She needs to walk 
for physical and mental health. But if she's gonna negotiate with a car, maybe 99 out of 100 times she wins, but one time she loses and she's dead. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. We gotta work on sustainable mobility, not just walking, but it's also riding bicycles, public transit, riding uh, new uses of cars. I'm not saying that this is the end of the car industry, but the way people are using cars is changing very, very fast. Places like America, in the US, in the last four years, the young people, 16 to 24, purchase fewer cars than in the last 40. Got fewer driver license than in the last 40. They don't want to own a car. They'd rather pay higher rent and live in a walkable neighborhood than have a car. The problem is that when we define cities around cars, all we get is more cars. And we have to invite our friends to help us cross the street. And then what do we do? We build more roads. As if that was gonna be a solution. You know, building roads to solve traffic jams is like trying to put out a fire using gasoline. It does not work. But if we define Istanbul and all cities around people, we're gonna get more people and healthier and happier people. And with the regards to new use of cars, now everybody's talking about autonomous vehicles. They drive less cars and they said, and they do really nice drawings and all of this. And they said, oh, we're not gonna have traffic jams because they're gonna be driving less cars. And I say, do you think that is the driver who's doing the traffic jam? <laughs> You know, if we don't change our behavior, this is what it might look. We might have a lot of traffic jams with driverless cars. This is what cities look like without autonomous vehicles. This is what they might look like with autonomous vehicles. We will have less parking because there will be more shared carrying, but we also might have many more trips. You come here, you don't find parking, you tell the car to go home and pick you up in two hours. You don't need a driver's license because there's no driver. So five-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 100-year-olds will be having cars. So we might have many more trips, more congestion, more sprawl. It can be great or it can be horrible. It depends up to all of us. How are we going to regulate the driverless car, the autonomous vehicles? Also, riding bicycles. Imagine in Istanbul going to school like this. This can be totally, your know, children would have so much fun. And parents and grandparents as well. You know, Copenhagen. This afternoon someone said, oh, but I'm not talking about Copenhagen. No, do talk about Copenhagen. Everything that Copenhagen has, Istanbul can have it, and better. I take every year city leaders from across North America on field trips to Copenhagen. And the first thing I tell them when we arrive there is I say, look, I hope that at the end of the trip, you will say it's not rocket science. No, it is not rocket science. For, to have people riding their bikes, you know. It's cold in the winter, it's hot in the summer, it rains all year round. And 41 out of 100 use their bike at the mode of mobility. In the downtown, it's 60%. But citywide, 41. And they're not saying 41 is enough, they want to go to 50. And men don't need shirts in the summer, or women don't need special shoes. So we want to improve bikeability. You know, it's not about painting things on the, on the street that people won't obey, or doing signs, or putting bicycle parking or those maps, none of those things really work. Putting racks on the buses, or now people are going crazy for these bicycles, bike share systems. That they are getting the saddle before the horse. That makes it nicer for the 2% that might be using bicycles in Istanbul, that makes it more enjoyable for that 2%, but that doesn't get more people. If we want more people, there are only two things that work. One, we need to lower the speed in the neighborhood so people can go to school and so on. And number two, we need a grid of protected bikeways. So everything that I said about walking and 30K is also for biking. But in addition of lowering the speed, we need to create the grid, a minimum grid of AAA bikeways. What's AAA? All ages and all abilities. And nothing as important as connectivity, connectivity, connectivity. Why? Because if you don't bike, and now they did one, and they say, oh, let's see people use it. Well, if 20% of your ride is gonna be safe, but still 80% is gonna be in the middle of the car, you won't use it. So we gotta think of daytime, and nighttime, and winter, and summer. It's not just about Sunday at 10 a.m., but it's about in the middle of the traffic jam, the peak hours. So we need to have that physical separation between the cyclists and the cars, or else it's not going to work. Painting a line might work for a photo at 5 o'clock in the morning, but people are not going to use it. We need to have, even if you don't have the political will or the money to do it permanent, at least don't just paint. Enhance the painting line with some plastic bollard that's going to make a huge difference. And of course, making a priority so that it is always clean and nice, even for the country that have winter. So those children, 
since they're little babies, they're on bikes. That's why people bike in Copenhagen, because they have a grid citywide. All the neighborhoods, lower speed. But all the big roads have protected bikes, but they have really good connectivity. Just the way that we have a citywide water grid, or citywide power grid, citywide bicycle grid. By the way, when people ask you about bikes, if it's good enough or not, keep in mind, we're talking about children. If it's not safe, for an eight-year-old, it's nothing. Don't even call it bikeway. We cannot do bikeways that are safe for the 20 to 15 spandex. We need bikeways that are safe for the children. They are the ones that we should be building infrastructure, the sidewalks and the crossings and the bikeways and the parks. We gotta keep children. And when you gonna get the attention of your politicians, go in front of city hall and do a protected bikeway like this and you're gonna get their attention of the media and elected officials and actually get them to ride 100 meters like this and then go on the other side of the street and ride 100 meters with nothing. And they will see the huge impact of having a protected bike or not. And if we're going through public transit, one of my brothers, as of two years ago, is mayor of Bogota, he said the civilized city is not the one where the poor have cars, it's the one where the rich use public transit. And it's about shaking people up. We've been, I've been hearing that a lot of the questions about how to get people changing minds. Well, one day a year, there are no cars. Make it a car-free day. But not one kilometer or two. See, eight million people, no cars. From 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. So successful that then Brussels went there, the mayor and he saw it, and he started doing it in Brussels. The only difference, Bogota does it on a Thursday, the first Thursday of February, and Brussels is doing it on a Sunday. Last Sunday, Brussels looked like this. This photo is from Sunday in Brussels. This photo is from Paris last Sunday. If Paris can do it, why not Istanbul? City-wide, no cars in Paris. This is about shaking people up on a day of reflection. What is the role of the car? What is the role of mobility in our cities? How do children feel? How do these children feel in, a, in, in the champs they say with no cars? But it wasn't just the champs they say, it was city-wide. But of course, we also need public transit, we need buses, we need trams, there are different possibilities. But we also need to dignify the transit. I go to some cities and I see these horrible buses. This is not dignity for the people using the public. I mean, sell advertising, but don't cover the windows. And especially don't cover the windows with cars advertisements. <laughs> because then it's really, really pain. You know, sometimes they do a bus stop. Look, this, this is busted for a child? It's an insult to the children. And when people say, oh, what are we going to do? Let's, you know, the mayor of Malmo didn't like, he said the people didn't like the buses. So he said, oh, I'm going to put a nose, I'm going to cover the wheels, and now they look like trains. Part of it is marketing. Part of it is, you know, it's also, and the people that want numbers, 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 rational, okay, tell them about mobility map. Mobility map. Do you want one of those or 140 of those? Do you want one of these or 145 of the others? So it's about the mobility map. Walking, cycling, transit moves a lot more people. Three, Istanbul, please be bold. You can be as good as any city. In all of these issues of public transit, of schools, of playgrounds. I know that cities, many cities in Turkey are moving, but some are moving fine, some are moving at the speed of the turtle. And they say, oh, it's okay because I'm faster than you. Istanbul. If you want to compare yourself with cities that are worse than you, you can do a list of a thousand cities. But if you compare yourself with cities that are worse, eventually you're going to look like those. But you got to start thinking, which cities of similar size, income, which one has the best mobility? Which one has the best walkability? Which one the children ha are happiest? Which one the children have the best parks, the best schools? So in so many ways, don't be complacent at all. And if any magazine is going to tell you, it's going to give you an award, Istanbul, the best city in the world, say, please, if you love Istanbul, don't give us any awards because then people become reluctant. Keep in mind that a big issue of the private public NGOs is how to attract and retain the best people. I was in Oslo, just to give you an example, a few months ago, this is the mayor, 67. Her deputy mayor is 31. And the Minister of Transportation and Environment is 30. And this 30-year-old is making Oslo pedestrian as of next year. Oslo is going to be the, cap the green capital of the EU. And she, 30-year-old, is making it. Barcelona, someone mentioned this earlier. 
it's already good walkable city. Now they want to improve it by 66%. So all of the grid that was good for walking, cycling, and cars, now two out of three is going to be walking. So a city that is good for walking is going to improve. Who would have thought that New York, if you had said anybody 10 years ago that New York, the Times Square was going to be pedestrian, they would have thought you were crazy. Well, they made it pedestrian, and now people are doing yoga and aerobics and all kinds of things. It's changing. Be bold. Malmo, a city they lost half of their jobs in two years. There used to be a shipping industry. They moved to South Korea. They had to reinvent themselves. And a lot of this was about children. Even a city that has lots of winter, but it's about that, creating that nice, cozy place. Four, we gotta have parks and park systems. Let me give you some symptoms because there are some symptoms you hear a lot when you listen and you see what you observe. One symptom of public places, good places to sit. This guy needed five chairs to be happy. On a bench, he would not have been as happy. His feet, his big mat. Sometimes people see monkey see, monkey does. No, sometimes it's people see, people do. <laughs> we do sidewalks and we, put, we don't put benches. The other day I was working with the mayor of uh, a city in Kentucky. I, 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 I will say the miracle, but not the same. We were walking 10 blocks. No benches. And I said, Mayor, there's no benches. And he said, Gil, the homeless. I said, what, you think this is like a miracle? You take out the bench and a home shows up? I said, not only you are not solving the homeless, but you are making it very, very hard for older adults. Older adults will not walk if there are no benches. And look for the children. They put these nails so the children and youth won't be able to see it. This guy was so tired, he sat on his briefcase while his friend actually fainted and his wife is sitting on their baby. <laughs> That's not good for the zero to five. <laughs> but when you got nice places to sit, it's kind of magical. Even in the middle of the winter, the old woman, when you have movable chairs, people don't even sit facing each other, starts to rain and people won't even move. Last time I was in Istanbul, I saw this guy that was sitting on a bullard <laughs> while his friend actually had like 10 chairs. <laughs> kind of a running. Another symptom is sociability. If you see people talking to each other, it is important. Another symptom, diversity. When you see children, you see youth, you see adults, you see people in handicap. Another symptom, affection. If you are affectionate with children, if you feel at ease, if you feel safe. Another symptom, high proportion of women. Women are more selective. If the place is not nice and clean and safe, they don't go. So these are some symptoms. But one, some characteristics of nice parks and public places. One, management. We need to manage. I would say the biggest problem in parks is lack of management. People tend to think that management is synonymous of maintenance, picking up the garbage and cutting the grass. No, we need, maintenance is not even 20% of management. Management is getting grandparents and children to do bread together. Management is the uses and the activities. It's having people here are walking and cycling and playing chess and riding bikes and reading and eating. Management is having volunteers, but having the tools for the volunteer. Management is having citizens engaged so that you ask the citizens before, during, and after when you are going to make any changes in the park. Management is having the resources, financial, physical, Management is having good equity throughout the city and go, having parks that are a good fit so that not all parks, you know, the parks in Copenhagen, I know that's, that, that we shouldn't talk too much about Copenhagen, but it's doable. Every single playground in Copenhagen is different. They are not two alike. They don't call up game time and say, hey, game time, send me 50 of those. No, everyone is different. It's really exciting and, and it's totally doable. That's part of the management. You go to Copenhagen, Four out of 10 parks, playgrounds, have some, a facilitator of games from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. Not all day, from four to, so that when the children come, they facilitate the games, the play, the playability. Four out of 10, it's amazing. So that all of this is management. Management is about safety. You know, I was in London the other day and I saw in a park design, you know, beware of the thieves. This is like an open invitation to the thieves of the city. You know, you need a lot of police when the parks and public places are empty. You don't need when they are well used. So the cheapest safety for any park or public place is uses and activities. Let's organize uses and activities in the summer, in the winter, all the time, so that people can go and paint and walk and socialize. I was in Mumbai and I see all of these people who are, are, are holding hands and doing circles. I say, what are they doing? They say, oh, it's laughing yoga. 
Get in the circle, I get in the circle, and two, 30 seconds later I'm laughing. People say, in Istanbul, do we need small parts or large parts? You need both, because they satisfy very different needs. Every child is to have a part within walking distance. So the small part is where we develop a sense of belonging, where we meet the neighbors, where we also develop solidarity. If something is happening in the neighborhood and we know the neighbors, we go out and help. If we don't know anybody, we shut the door and stay inside. But we cannot play football, so we need the medium-sized parks. And we cannot go canoeing, so we need the large parks. We need a city-wide park system with small, with medium, with large, with passive, with active, with contemplative. Everybody learns from everybody. I know some of you already think, oh, Gail, in Istanbul we are different. We got nothing in common with Copenhagen, of course, <laughs> or Bogota, or New York, or any of these examples. Here in Istanbul we are unique. I know. Always remember that in Istanbul you are absolutely unique. Just like everybody else. <laughs> you know, this is like on the computers that we copy and paste. No, but we can adapt and improve. Even within Istanbul, each neighborhood is different. Each park is different. Each street is different. But we can learn from others. For example, even small towns. Look at this. When you're talking about two or Cochrane, 5,000 people and two polar bears. I go there and I'm talking with all the leaders and community. The week before I had been to Google, so I started showing them some of the images, of course, of the autonomous vehicle from Google and all of these other things in Google. Their, their drones and the thing that they wanted to show off a little bit. But one of the things, there was someone from a high school, and what they really liked was the bicycle. So they said, why don't we do a, a bike share system in a community of 5,000? Let's do a bike share. They said, where are we going to get the bikes? No, let's go to the police and ask for lost and found. So they asked for the lost and found bicycle. They brought it to the school. They fixed them. They painted it like the Google bikes, and they created a bike share system. These are the kind of things that we can do for children 0 to 5 or 5 to 10 or 10 to... It's doing. Doing. It's just doing. What is the risk? There is no risk. And Fenton, a physical education teacher of an elementary school, she saw fewer and fewer kids were walking to school. She said, why don't they walk? Because they were afraid of the cars. So when the kids were home over Christmas, they came back and she was dressed up as a pylon. She shut down the parking lot. And then the kids at minus 24, they started to walk. And bike. We need hundreds of unfentons because part of it is programs and part of it is infrastructure. Part of it is hardware but part of it is software. Places like Toronto is going to grow by 50% in the next 25 years. So the provincial government put a green belt. No municipality can grow beyond that. Rotterdam was totally torn down in the Second World War, was built around the car. Look what they have done in the last eight years. They wanted to do a bike parking instead of they opened it up they made it really nice putting the bikes a little bit further down look at this what happens when you say oh car can you please give us one side of the street look what happens <laughs> you want to live on this street or you want to live on this so it's totally doable here in istanbul why not places that they're going to do a building here sometime in five years in 10 in 20 so they, in the meantime let's open it up and let's make it a park <laughs> So these are the kind of things that are totally doable and cities are doing around the world and of course you can do it. Owns a city of only 200,000 people and they said, okay, let's think about a plan of walking, cycling, cars, everybody. So they started working on this and then thinking of summer and winter and people going to work and to study. Lots of communication with the community. Always when there's more than 5,000 cars, there's a physically protected bikeway. There's a separation between the cyclists and the cars, signage, air, good signage so that people know where they're going, lockers, public washrooms so that you don't have to go to a coffee shop, on the ramp by parking in a city of 200,000 and they give the pedestrian streets. In the pedestrian you cannot ride your bike so either you leave your bike out or you walk with your bike. So all of this is really nice. You know, and in many places we have in front of the schools, 30k an hour in front of the schools. Here in Ons, in front of the school is 0k an hour. From 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. there are no cars. Only the people that live in front of the school, and they can go out only very, very slow. And they got these ping pong tables and games. So children love to go to school early because they chat with their friends and play, and the playability and making the link. So that is the idea. It's a city that works for all. A city that works for children is going to work for everybody. See, let's focus on the benefits. This is not about the zero to five. This is not about the parks or the streets or the walking or the cycling. This is about creating cities for all people. So when we are going to talk about cities zero, zero to five, 
less than elected officials or citizens or media is about the benefits. It's about as a great city for children, it's going to be good for culture, for education, for recreation, environment, transportation, health, for everything. And we need to have different reasons because maybe one politician doesn't care about the environment but cares about economic development. So let's tell him why it's good for, but the other one doesn't care about economic development but cares about the health. So we need to have the specific reasons for each one according to each politician. For example, if it's going to be health, is this what the future looks like? You know, the issue of obesity is becoming really bad around the world. And you know how people look, that they have to do with heart attacks and respiratory problems and anxiety and depression. In Turkey, more than one out of three people are obese, especially women. It's really, really bad. Women are twice as obese as men. So it's important to work on that. Over the last 25 years, it has doubled. It has doubled. It went from less than 18% to more than 37%. So it's important to work in the, work in the school lunches, have farmers markets all over the place, have urban agriculture so that the children know that the tomatoes don't come out of a factory and they love it. And also being active. It's not about marathons. It's just about doing 60 minutes a day for children, 30 minutes a day for adults. 60 minutes a day. And of course, walking or cycling. By the way, the only way, the only way that we can get people to be physically active is to walk or bike as a normal part of everyday life. There is no other way. No city in the world has had 50% people be physically active that is not walking or cycling as a normal part of everyday life. You can play football, but you play once or twice a week. You go to the gym once or twice a week. But massively to be physically active, there is no other way. That's another reason why walking and cycling is so important. That's why it's so important for children to walk or bike to school. But this is good for physical health. But also there is no health without mental health. We gotta keep in mind issues like loneliness. We have a lot of problems with loneliness with children. With teenagers, many teenagers committing suicide, going into drugs, into alcohol, older adults as well. When people are lonely, it increases the 28 percent and the probability of heart disease, 38 percent stroke, twice the possibility of dementia. Depression has become the, the, the world leading cause of disability. So if we have contact with nature, it's going to improve our mood, our cognitive attention. So we need to have trees and green areas everywhere. It's going to, if our neighborhood is green, it's going to lower the depression, the anxiety, the stress, and it's totally doable. But we need to give nature the importance that it has. We gotta have nature everywhere. We gotta have nature interwoven. We need it in, in our homes, we need it in the schools, we need it in the sidewalks, we need it in the city, in the business. We, need, we really need nature everywhere. This is absolutely critical. It's not just because cities look nice, but it's because it's gonna be, or because it's good for the environment, it's also good for health, for physical, for mental health. Children love nature. So we need to have it interwoven, everything. And also because more people are gonna go to the parks and empty parks have fewer benefits. So we gotta have people doing activities like they were doing in Tirana and in many other places. The walkability, the paths, whether it is London or Paris, we need those activities, but all of it, nature, nature, nature. Seven, community is the extra. Let's ask the citizens, what do they want? We honestly have to listen to the citizens. What are we going to do in the park? Oh, let's do yoga. And in that other park, oh, let's do yoga. No, not everybody wants to do yoga. Some people wanna have a fire pit. Always want to have a pizza oven. People want to do all kinds of activities in the park. So we need to listen. We need to go and ask the, both the users and even more the non-users because the non-users, maybe they don't go is because there is nothing that they like in the park. So we got to go and listen. The children, we do lots of things with children. We ask them even simple things like saying, please do a drawing. What would you like your community to look like when you have your parents' age and you have children your own age? Look at this. The children love the environment. Any country, anywhere, it's really great. And it's not because they are the future, it's because if we educate the children very, very well, like the former mayor Curitiba said, they go home and they, they educate their parents. Look at this, Edgar, he's only 13, but he wrote, I want few cars, more people walking, more people cycling. He didn't write, but he drew an area for pedestrians, for cyclists, for buses, for cars. He doesn't know that we walk at five kilometers an hour, but he knows that if we mix pedestrians and cyclists, the pedestrian gets injured. If we mix cyclists and cars, the cyclists get injured. And then he drew public parks and low buildings with street level activity. So if anybody is a student of urban planning, I hope you study very, very hard. Because now the 13 year olds can summarize urban planning 101 in one drawing. It's really exciting. Three days ago, I was in Gothenburg in Sweden. I went with the heads of parks 
planning, transportation, and real estate, and the councillors uh, that, that were in charge. We were going to visit the places where the city is going to grow. And one, we went to the biggest place that is going to call River City. And I love this. I, I see all of these children playing. You know, they are working. They're going to work for 18 months with children to get ideas from children. The children think they're just playing. But more than playing, they're giving information to the planners. The planners are watching. The planners are listening. The planners are doing all kinds of activities. And these kids are going to design. The city has a big anniversary in 2021, and the park is going to be ready by 2021. And we need to listen to the children. They have to be a key element in the planning. And the last message is, I hope everybody leaves being a guardian angel of the gentle majority. What is the gentle majority? The children, the older adults, the poor. Let me give an example. Children, let's see. We go to Istanbul, we go on the sidewalk, and we see we have swings. Or we're waiting for the bus and there's a small park. Or we can do really nice bus stops. This is not about the money. It's about having the creativity, allowing people to be a little bit flexible. This is a much nicer bus stop than the one we saw earlier. And having the children do drawings. And you just see it in their faces, in their smile, how important it is. And people say, give, this is great because the children have fun and games. Of course, it's fun and games, but it's much more than that. It's also how children learn, playing. Children play, that's how they develop their muscle strength, their cognitive thinking, their sense of belonging, their sociability, their friends, the capacity to concentrate, to learn languages. That's why we're going to have playability everywhere, all over the cities, and it's doable. By the way, what is a child's favorite toy? Another child. <laughs> you have children together, and they love it and they have fun. This is going to be the future engineers of the world. It's totally dual. That's why we should have, everybody, every kid should have a park within walking distance. So let's start doing parks. Wherever there's not a park within walking distance, let's start doing it. And very important is the under five. You know, because I go to so many cities. The other day I was at a city and the mayor showed me, he, he took, uh, had someone take me to 20 parks. And then he said, what do you think? And I was with him, all of his team. And I said, Mayor, let me show you four dog parks that you have. They dog, perfect fence, perfect benches, cover for the summer. And I said, you really know what makes dogs happy. But I went to 21 of your parks, and I did not see one of them that had anything for children zero to five. So you know much more what makes dogs happy than what makes children happy. And they smile a little bit nervous. But afterwards that night, the mayor said, Gil, thank you. Thank you for shaming us a little bit. Because I've been there for 15 years, and I will never ever will do another, another park where I don't, a playground where I don't think of the zero to five. And that is going to happen to everyone that was in that room. We need to work on this. People don't really, as soon as you tell anybody, the Bernard Van Leer Foundation idea that is, what does a city look like from 95? People don't forget about that. That's why it's so important to make this massive, to educate the media, educate the businesses, the decision makers, the politicians. Because this is absolutely critical in the happiness. And if you don't have a park, let's think of what belongs to us. Whatever is public, the street, the sidewalk, the, the schools, the libraries. Someone spoke a little bit about New York. Look what New York did. They, they thought every kid had a park within walking distance. They did a map and many did not. So then they said, the schools, the libraries, the streets, let's go to the schools. They went to the schools. Horrible. This is what 90% of the schools in America, their playground looks like, a bunch of painting. So they said, schools, we'll fix the school, if and only if we make it a school park, that after 4 p.m., Saturdays, Sundays, and holidays, we open it to the community. And look what they did, fantastic. Look at all of these green roofs and trees. By the way, how mo why so much green? Because the, the kids have less attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder if there is green. But New York didn't do one or two. They have done more than 220. They have increased by more than a quarter the playgrounds in the city without buying one centimeter of land. That's part of being sustainable. We need to make all of these school parks, library parks, street parks, sidewalk parks. We gotta have playability everywhere. Copenhagen, all of these are schools, and this is for the school during the daytime, for the community in the evening, and weekends, and holidays, and if you don't have a school, take over a street, make it a play street. But not one or two, do a pilot here or there. Pilots are great, but if and only if, you know that the pilot has to multiply. You do the play street. If it doesn't work, 
get rid of it. But if it works, then have 20, 50, 100 play streets all over the city. Because we're not have in a city just one street intersection or one, uh, or, or, or one play street. Of course, if it's nice for the child, it's going to be nice for the older adult. This is important because, you know, we live in longer, so much longer. The people that have ever lived to 65 in the history of humanity, half are alive today. Half. This is very, very new. And the population of the 65 are going to double, and the population of 80 are going to quadruple, and people are happy and enjoying. People are not even thinking of retirement. People are thinking this about how to re-engage. I would say the people over 65, it is the biggest waste of resource that we have in the world. People retire and we cross them out as if they had died. Except that they got 20, 30, 40 years left. And they are healthier and wealthier and more active. They have experience, they have knowledge. Imagine they could be fantastic. Imagine the urban 95 with the leaders are they 65 plus. The, the, the university, here we are at a university, 20% of the course is before older adults. Older adults are hungry, but hungry of knowledge. They want to learn about music and garden and playing. Just imagine, if we had been born in Turkey 150 years ago, which is nothing, the life expectancy was 35. Most of us would be dead by now. Now it's almost over 80. You have more than double the life expectancy. It's very clear that we have learned how to survive, but when we still have all of these issues, it's clear that we need to learn how to live. And urban 95 and children in cities all of this is about learning how to live because a big part of this is about the built environment. How are we going to do it? Older adults are terrified of losing the driver's license. Almost as much as when they are told that they have cancer. Not because they love cars, because they love mobility. People want to age in place. Visit the same stores. And so we need to think how are we going to make that city nice for children and nice for older adults. But whenever we do playgrounds, I love this skateboard park, not only because it has a nice street, but because it has a nice place for parents and grandparents. Every time that we do a playground, we need to do a nice cozy area for grandparents. This is a magical moment. Yeah, the grandparent and the child go into the park. It's fantastic. And of course, there's going to be lots of uses and activities. By far, the number one activity is walking. Every single park in Turkey should have, and around the world should have a walking path. Whether it's a big park or a small park, walking path, because it's the most used. But there are many other things. I'm talking about children, the multi-generational or intergenerational. Grandparents and grandchildren is kind of magical. So we need to have that nice, cozy place. As important as the swing or what is the cozy area for the parents, for the grandparents, so that we can find these magical moments taking place. This was when I was at a session with Bernard Van Leer in Amsterdam with Place Making Week, or this is in Copenhagen. Uh, this, anyway, this was last week. You know, it's magical, that intergenerational, so those activities, let's work on that and make it a reality. And the third element that I said, children, all the girls, and the poor. I'm not talking about equality, I'm talking about equity. The other day someone did a cartoon that explained this is equality and this is equity. He said, you know, some people are starting so far behind that some might not need a box. Some might, others might need two and three boxes. And someone said, okay, if that's equality and that's equity, maybe this is reality. But in Istanbul, you are even smarter because you say, okay, let's think outside the box. Maybe it's not about moving boxes. Maybe it's taking down the wall. And we have not done a good job, especially with children. Look at the share of children living in poverty. The U.S. is the wealthiest country in the world, and the, the U.S. has many good things. Equity is not one of them. One out of five children live in poverty. South Korea, one out of 14. Denmark, one out of 37. From the point of view of mobility, the people that have a car, they spend one out of five, 50, 20% of their income on mobility. If they took public transit or walk back, they would spend in only 5%. So this would be great for the, for the personal economy as well as for the local economy because if people don't have part, they would be spending that money in the restaurants, fixing their houses, all of this, how do we want to live? So I just want to end by saying, all of this is doable. Think outside the box, this is not a financial issue, this is not a technical issue, this is political. But political with a big P, everybody needs to participate. All citizens, this is not a time to be spectators. We need to create alliances. And I said like a three-legged stool. One of the legs are the elected officials, all levels, the city, the, 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 the country. Another leg is the public sector staff, but not only planners. We gotta get planners and public health is one of the best. I like public health, economic development, environment, parks and recreation. And the third leg is the community, the activists, the media, the universities, the businesses. 
How do we get the three legs working together? What is the glue? The glue is developing a sense of urgency. Each city has different sense of urgency. Sometimes even each neighborhood has a different sense. Once you have the sense of urgency, then you develop a shared vision. But you need the vision and you need action. Some cities develop the vision but no action. So they become frustrated because they know what needs to be done but they don't do it. Others, the opposite, develop action. They do here, 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 they're doing, but they, they don't know where they're going. So it's like a Frankenstein. But when you have a vision and you have action, you can really transform cities in Turkey into vibrant and healthy communities. And you're going to move from talking to doing. And they're going to tell you, oh, but we are doing. Yes, you are doing, but you're going to do more and you're going to do it faster. So Istanbul, let's do it. Now. Thank you. Gil and thank you everyone uh, and maybe I can invite you to sit down because you might be um, so I'm, I'm going to make some brief comments because I think it's uh, more enlightening to continue listening to you and all the brilliant ideas you've shared with us today but I do want to highlight something because I, I think it's very important that after this uh, uh, two days of discussions uh, I think that the one issue that we didn't talk about was mobility uh, so I do want to highlight on um, how enlightening it, it is to hear you. And uh, of course, coming from South America, I'm very familiar with the experience of Bogota. And I, and I know that it, it also has a lot of challenges. And I, and I know that the current mayor, which is your brother, Enrique Peñalosa, uh, has also had lots of challenges in trying to promote these ideas around equity and uh, around uh, promoting a healthy city. Uh, so I'm very curious to, to, continue, to continue the discussion on these uh, topics. Uh, but uh, I would like to focus on, on two specific things. Uh, I think what, in, uh, what you have, uh, Gil, what you have shared with us today is that we have the great opportunity of really transforming Istanbul into a more thriving city, into a more vibrant city. I think Istanbul is one of the more, most vibrant cities I've been to. Uh, but meaning that when you think about converting this city into a vibrant city, you take into account equity and healthy and promoting equity and healthy which seems to be one of the ideas that we defend in urban 95 as well i do want to say that we've been trying to convince gil that when he talks about 880 he also talks about eight months eight years old and 80 years old because we really think that babies uh, have a different stage and, and as you have shown in, in many different examples i think uh, this is definitely true uh, but I, I want to come back to my question, and I, I would like to ask you, Gil, what do you think are some of the political challenges? Because I, I would definitely agree with you that we need the political will in order to promote these changes, and we all need to be part of this change. But sometimes, uh, when there is the political will, promoting these changes can also have lots of challenges. Uh, and, and, I, and I know this through Basically, for example, when, when you show that picture of Bogota, on uh, the investments that were done in order to prioritize pedestrians and, and people on bikes, and not probably investing on the car industry, you were making a political decision that has a huge impact. But that also represents a, a huge challenge when you're working with people. Uh, can you share some of your thoughts on how you can overcome some of these challenges? Because I, I think this doesn't always make you the most popular mayor. Um, it brings difficult challenges. And I, I think it would be very enriching to share some of those thoughts. Well, I think that if you want to be a popular mayor, if you want to be a beauty queen, uh, don't do any change. Uh, that's one of the biggest problems. When cities have, they don't have term limits, it's indefinite then usually when a city councilor or a mayor wins, their number one priority that same night of the win is how to get reelected four years or five years from then. Uh, and the easiest way to get reelected is don't do any change, just do more of the same. So unfortunately, that is one of the reasons why it's important that you participate in politics and hopefully get elected mayors that want to do as mayors. Because many just want to be mayors. Just be mayor, go in a cocktails, inaugurations, uh, be at the international scene, but don't do anything. The reality is that uh, 
many times it's, it's harder. And then some mayors, they don't get reelected. Mayor Livingston in London did a lot of really good things for walking, for cycling, created the congestion tax, and then he was not reelected. But he's totally okay with that. He said if that is the cost, uh, and that is a big problem when you have big cities like Bogota, for example, that most of the mayors, they don't want to be mayor of Bogota. They want to be presidents of the country. So they're only using the term as mayor is, 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 is as a stepping stone to something else. So it, it is very, very important. I think that in, th in, in this term, in the case of my brother, he's doing a lot of decisions that are not very popular. For example, people wanted to do an underground subway. And then he said, okay, that's fine, let's do the underground subway. But that underground subway is gonna eat up all of the resources for public transit for the next 20 years. And we're gonna move 4% of the people. How are you gonna move the other 96%? Oh, no, no, we don't care how the other, we, but there is no city inside the Bogota without a sub. I'm not asking you if there is any. Oh, no, but Mexico City has a sub. No, I'm talking about Mexico. How are you gonna move the other 96 and, and of course, if he had come in and had committed all of the budget for the next 20 years into one, uh, then he probably would be the, the most popular mayor in the country today. So I, I think that it's important for you to get engaged and participate and hopefully elect councillors and mayors that want to do whatever is right. By the way, we not only need to do things right, but also we need to do the right things. Let me give you an example. If you do a street without any sidewalks, and people say, oh, let's do it right. Maybe doing it right is doing it cheaper or doing it faster. If you still do it without sidewalks, you are, not, you are doing it right, but you're not doing the right things. So it's, it's, it, that, there's a big difference between doing the right and doing the right things. What I like about uh, Gil's experience is that he has been able to do many of these big changes in, in Bogota, and now you're doing and advocating around the world about this. Um, so I would like to ask you again, uh, what, what do you think is the best way to advocate for young children? Because of course that's our interest. And what do you see has worked on, on your work in advocacy? So of course sharing all of these good ideas, but uh, I think there's a, there's a big step between inspiring people. I'm sure that everybody who lives this room today will be very inspired and very engaged and continue doing these things. Uh, uh, but of course this represents a lot of advocacy, but I'm, I'm trying to ask you, what do you think works better from an advocacy point of view? Or what have you seen work that be works better when you want to start implementing things. Because you when, did, yeah. like, uh, and he didn't mention this, but for example, the uh, Ciclovia in Bogota, which is the first city that actually started with Ciclovia, uh, started reproducing, and it was replicated in almost every Latin American city, the uh, capital city that I know. And uh, it, it's been very popular, and it still, it still is very popular. Uh, but I think you were the first followers, yeah. you were the pioneers doing that. No, but you know, in many cities, what I, what I will say is this. Is the heart, not the brain. Whenever you go to the decision makers, people think too much about the brain. They do numbers and statistics and studies. And forget about the studies. 99%, I mean, they were in a university, so please keep doing research. <laughs> oh, more research is helpful. But we already have most of the information. I mean, to create a city that is good for small children, we've known for the last 40 years that the first five years of the life are the most important. But nevertheless, Governments are not putting importance. I mean, I live in Canada, in a wealthy country. Playground, to, I mean playground, daycare. To go to daycare in Ontario is more expensive than to go to university. It's crazy. I've never understood since I immigrated like 19 years ago, how can it be elementary free, secondary free, university heavily subsidized, but daycare is extremely expensive, it's more expensive. And we know, so why is it that when I went to Tel Aviv and I went to 20 cities, I couldn't find one single with anything for children zero to five. Uh, I think the big part of it is we need to get elected officials in the heart. It's not, we know the numbers, we know the statistics, but, but then we need to make a connection. So we need to connect, uh, for example, I was, in, 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 you mentioned the Ciclovia or Open Street that we call it in North America. I was in, 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 in Christchurch in New Zealand, and I'm with the mayor, and she, I learned that she had recently started a huge program against obesity, and that she has a daughter that has huge problems of obesity. So then I'm starting to talk to her about obesity and about losing weight and whatever, and then uh, I knew that was gonna hit it in the heart. And then I said, oh, and by the way, in Bogota we have this program on Sunday that we get 1.7 million, one out of four citizens, and this has also worked in Guadalajara and in Quito, blah, 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 blah. 
She loved the idea. She had never heard of the word ciclovia, or she had never heard of the, the program. She said, Gil, are, are, are you going to be here tomorrow morning? Can I invite you for two hours? Uh, and I go to her office, and she has all of the counselors and the, 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 the members, the commissioners. And we start talking about it. She said, I want you to tell us about ciclovia. I speak for an hour, then we debate, they debate for an hour. And in two hours, people that had never heard of the country, she said, okay, we need to pass an amend that, a, a law that in 90 days, we're gonna start an open switch program in Christchurch. So it was about, if I had come up and started with the number, the statistic, and say, oh, look at the quality of the air, or the, no, no, it's not about the numbers. Once people like anything, then they tell one of their, uh, assistant or something said, look, we want to do this playground from zero to five. Please give me a study of a hundred pages of, to justify it. Anybody can justify it, but, but, but we need to get them engaged. So I, I said, don't talk, don't talk too much about children zero to five, but talk about the benefits. Tell them why having children zero to five. For example, if, if the mayor is really into economic development, tell look, all of the young people, they want to go and live in cities where there are nice playgrounds and parks. Then you know, uh, Boeing Corporation, they did a search where they were gonna set up their headquarters. They, out of like, like a hundred cities, they narrowed down to five, and then they sent their top executives to all five, and they chose Chicago. The number one reason, because of the parks and activities. I said, these, most of these are millennials, people that now are between 30 and 45, and they have children, and they wanna live in a city that has playgrounds. So then it's because of economic development. Say, these people will not come if you don't have good schools, if you don't have good daycares, if they don't have parts for two little children. So it's a, but another mayor might not care about economic development, but the other mayor is into environment. So then you can tell them about, oh, you know, by the way, the trees and the quality of the air and the noise and this, and this city, this, and it went down. And, and they say, oh. So the issue of the children zero to five is the, it is the means, it's not the end. The end is how to have the city economically vibrant. How to have the best young minds because behind them are going to be the best companies. Or how to have the cleaner city or the best climate change or the best education or the best culture. But focus on the benefits much more than on, 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 the, on the issue itself. And of course, do the research. Maybe if the mayor or the council who is making the decision has children or grandchildren or whatever, try to make that link because making that emotional link. So, so I think it's much more important to get decision makers in the heart and then the head, because usually we do go, oh, we gotta have a study, we gotta get the number. That's what they always say as an excuse. Oh, give me the numbers. That's because they don't wanna do it. But if you hit them in the heart, then forget, they get the numbers themselves. We know why this is important. But focus on the benefits. Couldn't agree more, and I think that uh, one of the highlights of, uh, of tonight's uh, presentation, or at least for me, was this phrase that you mentioned that let's uh, have cities and, and the measure of good cities to be the city where you want to sleep home and you want to live outside. That's so, very important, <laughs> especially because, for example, I, I work in many low income cities. And when I'm in the low income cities, people say, oh, you know, the poor people, they have so many needs. Uh, you know, why worry about sidewalks or this? I said, look. No. If you really care about poor people, when the poor people really feel miserable, it's in the leisure time. When they are working, the president of the Bank of Turkey or the minimum wage worker cleaning the floors has similar experience. Maybe even the president has more stress. But in the leisure time, the president has movies and theater and restaurants and country clubs and travels and so The minimum wage worker doesn't. So if we improve that, it's even more important. So we need in the low income neighborhoods when, when, when I'm saying, imagine we had a magic wand and we could redo one third of Istanbul, the best one third, we would do it even better. Well, over the next 30 years, we're gonna do the equivalent of one third of Istanbul. How are you going to do it? And make sure that in the low income, you need even better sidewalks and better bikes and better parks and better schools and better, and better connectivity because it, the reality is that the low income are gonna live in very small houses. 30, 35 square meters, and, that's, and it's gonna be almost impossible to do it bigger. They're not gonna live there, they're gonna sleep there, they're gonna live outside. So the low income need even better public space, and, and this is an issue of equity, and it's something that, that, that is really important. It's not only just for the upper income. Unfortunately, in most countries, we are doing great public places only for the upper income. You go to Mexico City, 
And they, then they say, oh, now we have public bikes. Yeah, but all of them are in Polanco and Condesa, where the wealthy people of the city lives. And they say, oh, now we'll have these bikes. And again, 90% are in the wealthy neighborhoods. No, we, we, we really need to work on equity. And it's not just, sometimes it's good to do it in the African neighborhoods as, as a sample, so that it becomes aspirational. The wealthy people of Mexico City want to live like the wealthy people of Miami. The people who wealthy of Miami want to live like the wealthy of Paris. So then maybe, it, but the reality is that we need to invest in where the lower income people live. But those, the children in the lower income need a lot more facilities and programs than, than the others. That's why what I'm saying, Copenhagen, for our employers, they have a passive, an activator. It's not just about having the games, it's about having an activator in four out of ten playgrounds from 4 to 7 p.m. Uh, and especially where more immigrants and more people that maybe are not used to, 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 to playing outside and so on, that's what they're doing. Thank you, Gil. And with this, I, I would really like to thank you. I think uh, you've put into, uh, into the topic for us a uh, part of working with Urban 95 has to do with trying to support equity because we do believe that a lot of the inequity in the world is concentrated not only in children but in young children and women. So I think we have a great challenge to solve there and I'm happy to see that all the people here are part of that change. So thank you very much for inspiring us tonight and giving us all these beautiful ideas that I think are very easy to replicate and adapt and, and just uh, see great success in the future. Thank you, and I just want to say, keep in mind, there is not going to be a Martian coming down to fix Istanbul or any other city in the world. It's up to all of us working together, the teachers, the public health and professional, the elected officials, the city staff, the person from the media, uh, everybody. But at the same time, it's doable. That's why I show a lot of examples, as simple as that teacher shutting down the parking. Of course, it wasn't easy. She said, the first day I thought the parents were going to beat me up. They, they were so great, but I said, good morning, good morning, and the children love their first time as a pilot. And then he's doing those kind of things. So some, there are a lot of things that are very inexpensive. Sometimes I tell people, start with the impatience and not the orchids. What are the impatience? Are things that are, lo, the impatience are flowers that are nice, but are very inexpensive. So I said, low cost, low risk, high visibility, because that will give you the credibility to do things that are bolder and more expensive. The other day, someone said, okay, when I'm with my children walking on the sidewalk, the sidewalk is very dark. And I said, yeah, but that's not an impatient, low cost, low risk. That's an orchid, because the orchids are higher cost and years to do five. She said, no, it's very inexpensive. When I'm walking home, the sidewalk is very dark, but the street is very well lit. She said, the street don't need so much light because the cars already have lights. All I'm asking the city is for someone to go up on the ladder, turn the light 90 degrees, and share it with the sidewalk. The same pose, the same light, the same cable. When I go to cities, most cities, and you will see when you go out in Istanbul, most streets are very well lit, and most sidewalks are very dark. And it's as simple. That, 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 that is two lessons. One is that there are a lot of things that are very inexpensive that we can do tomorrow. And, the, and two is that we get a lot of benefit from communicating Sorry. with the citizens, from listening to the community, from honestly listening. Not just because the, the politicians ask for it, so that, oh, did you call the community? Yes, check. No, it's because we actually want to hear and the community has fantastic ideas that are doable. Thank you, Gil, and thank you, everyone, for a great time. I hope we do it again in two years, if not earlier. Uh, thank you so much for being with us and all of our uh, presenters and response panels for uh, all the lovely conversations. I would like to just invite, uh, so thank you. I would just like to invite for a photo. Um, any of you who want to be in touch with us, we already have uh, those of you who have registered through our webpage. We have uh, your uh, emails and we will send a short note. Um, Eğer bizim zaten eğer web sayfası üzerinden kayıt yaptırdıysanız e-mail adresiniz var hala yaptırabilirsiniz. E, kayıt yapanlara bir e, iletişim notu biz de atacağız. E, bu, bu sayede eğer ilgilenmek isterseniz bu konuya daha fazla iletişimde kalabiliriz. Çok çok teşekkürler.